So hello and welcome everyone to the fifth session of Develop on Backend Engineering with Django. Previously, we had had sessions on front-end development using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and also GitHub. Here are the links. So I hope you have gone through those assignments and also those videos because they covered most basic topics. So briefly talking about that, us, all these were stat static web pages. So static web pages are web pages that delivers to the user's browser, web browser exactly as stored, in contrast to dynamic web pages which are generated by an application. These type of web pages can be made with just HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and they run on the client's browser. Also, they require a static web server or a, or a content delivery network to just serve those files with, with the client request. For example, GitHub pages which we used in the first assignment, and also like the Firebase static hosting, which was in I think the bonus assignment here. And also we can have some more scalable options like like Amazon Web Services S3 bucket. So these can actually render your websites very fast. And all the logic is implemented in the JavaScript, which is running on the front end. And there's no nothing which runs on the back end. These are simple to make and host, but have limited functionalities. Like currently, we have just covered web apps, but also we can have mobile or desktop applications which can run on the client machine and, and work as the front end. So I hope everyone is able to understand till now. And you can please just comment in the chat. So now the question is, why do we need a backend? So what a backend does is, it, it generates the responses dynamically based on the request of the user or the current session or the stored cookies, which store the history of how what the user has how the user has interacted with the website. Also, whenever you need an authentication or a login, you will need to have a backend for every user that can allow you to control and serve the responses depending on which user it is. And also, we can have some sophisticated computations which are needed to be done by a cloud machine. For example, let's say you have a machine learning model which runs only on Python. So for that, you will need to use libraries like NumPy, TensorFlow, etc., which run best on the uh, separate machine. So in that case, you will want to send the request parameters on from the client side and let the server server process it. And just a basic example, I think we have showed in the last session also in the demo. And this server was running Node.js. It was taking some numbers and it was returning up doing a mathematical uh, approximate the mathematical calculation of squ squaring them. So this, this was a basic example. But we can have much more complicated libraries which run on the backend and even use powerful resources which come with cloud services. And finally, Whenever a database is needed to be accessed, the access should be controlled based on the custom functions instead of allowing direct rewrite. <laughs> like let's say you have the databases of marks of every student. Of course, the student will need in is in a way changing the, the database, but it's not changing them directly. It is maybe changing by answering some questions correctly or otherwise. So we want that first the user should give us some request and we should evaluate that request and then make the changes. Also, also the once we have a database, we can also use it to create forms where we can up, and also upload files. And also, when we are using some external services, like we will get API keys and access tokens, which are usually paid. So for that, we will have to store, store them as a secret in our backend. Otherwise, if you pass them to the front end, everyone will be, will be able to use them. And that will overuse our quota limit. So this is a three-tier architecture which is used widely so basically you have this client which can be either website or a mobile or which runs on the front end and in the logic tier you have this server which you are going to start working on and finally it interacts with the database and more on the three tier architecture you can find on this link by ibm this is a well established architecture
Now, what is a database? A database stores data persistently. That means it doesn't get deleted when we sh shut down the server or restart it. Compared to, let's say, the, the other kind of storage or the normal variables you have, which get deleted once you restart the machine. You, want, you might want to save data like a table in an Excel-like CSV format. How many have used the CSV format earlier? You can reply in the chat. Yeah. And also JSON. So CSV and JSON are very convenient formats for storing small data. But first of all, they, when you have a very large database, these might not give the best performance, like for reading, writing, and also uh, saving data on local files is not always recommended while deploying to other servers. But when we have a database, ma database management system like SQL, SQLite, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, or DynamoDB, they are coded to be very efficient in storing, retrieving, and modifying data. So basically, SQLite and PostgreSQL are based on SQL which kind of save data in a table-like format. MongoDB and DynamoDB are called NoSQL, so those, this show data more like a JSON format. And these use the B3 data structure, which are advanced versions of binary tree data structures. Like they can have more than two nodes and they can be stored on disk also. And they are, and, and they are implemented in C or C++ at core. Like if I just open the implementation of the, let's say, SQLite, GitHub, we can see the source code that it is implemented mostly in C. That's why it's very coded to be very fast. And similarly for Mongo also. So I think in some of your courses, you must have done study about trees or binary trees, right? Yeah, so for which batch was it included in the call 100 for both batches or only for batch B? Okay, batch B. Now let's talk about SQL. SQL is all interactions to, to a database can be broken down as individual queries. Like let's say I want to create a database. I want to insert some values into the database. I want to maybe sell it, find some values, update or delete them. So, so for all these kind of queries, we have this structured query language. This, this kind, this language works on relational database, which are basically like tables. Like you, you can have a column which will represent a field, like let's say name, age, and the rows will represent the the value entries, and each cell will represent the value. <laughs> like so let's say name is Aditya, age is twenty. So I can show you a quick demo. By spinning up a SQLite server. If I just open SQLite 3, I can do create database, let's say ages, or let's say people. Okay, I will have to first go to the docs of SQLite, split docs. Yeah, I go to create table. So the structure works like this: create table, the name, and then okay. I think yeah, I should also provide the schema for the definitions. Let's say I have a field of name which is yeah, which is I think text and let's say I have page which is num. Let's say int. <laughs> now I've created the table. So I so now I'm going to use the insert command. So 
it is insert i'm going to follow this insert into table values these so let me try i hope you can see my command window yeah insert into people values and it just in pages pages 20 so that was the insert operation the select operation is like actually find so when you have to query something like actually see which matches data you can use this like if i write select star let me show the select syntax here yeah <laughs> where is it select <laughs> i'm going to select all from this table without any of these other conditions it is a very complicated query select star from people so it was the value which i have inserted so i can maybe insert more values let's say Arctic 19 so i have two of these lab hub let's say into one so as you can see this is just like a excel or a csv table like first the the value and the second value so separated by this symbol now if we can try to make the yeah, let's try to make the select query more selective so i can select the result column so let's say i just want the ages so i will say select age from people the people table so i have got all this ages 20 19 21 Similarly, I can have select star from people where age greater than 20, greater than equal to 20. This where clauses puts a condition. So I have all those which have 20. Or I can have something like where name equal to other just thing. So I have got my own entry. Similarly, we can try to update things like let's say Karthik has grown older now. So update is equal to let me first try to see the syntax again. Let me go to the documentation. I see update. Sorry. Yeah, update the table name and we just set the column to the expression where this. So update people, then set set age equal to twenty where. And the expression name equal to carpet. Now, if I just do the whole table, so people see the age is updated. And also, I might want to delete those entries. Like, let's say now I don't care about the age of Abhub, so I can just use the delete query and let this go to delete delete from table where this expression is satisfied let's see what kind of expression it can be so i'm going to make a simple query cell where delete from people where name equal to 
now this is deleted so these are called the basic operations on the database which are create read update and delete so so far how many have in, enjoyed writing sql with me you can write in the chat So the thing with SQL is that I have, you can make, think of the database in very basic terms, like what the actual query will be to, ma to make the change. But it is not recommended to write SQL query strings manually every time because they, get, they become a hassle when you are working with bigger tables. Like here I had only these two, I had only these two columns and I had to insert the values for each of them. But let's say if I have a like 10, 20 columns, then it would be a very hassle to write all these queries manually, like to make sure that each of these are in the same order and these fall, follow the same conventions. Like in the age, I have put an integer, but I want it to be greater than zero. If I, for the name, I, want, I might want to, it to be a small. So this is why it's not always recommended to write SQL. Like in some someone might end up in, entering a negative value for age and also there are many vulnerabilities associated with SQL like there's an, a very, very famous vulnerability called SQL injection so in that let's say someone has so you have written this query but in, in the name someone writes enter something like this okay let me show you an example Like earlier it was Vabha, the name was Vabha, and so we were, we were writing it as Vabha, but now I think, I hope you can see the quotation marks clearly. No, well if, if, if someone inputs some things like let's say Vabha, or one equal to one. Then this will get transformed to Vabha or one equal to one. And this symbol of two dashes are used for commenting. So if I write such a query, Vabha or one equal to one. Now this deleted my whole database. So you can see that a simple error can make a lot of damage to your whole database. So it's always better to use something like uh, Django or some other tool which can which is managing all these queries for yourself. Like you are using SQL, but you're not writing those queries manually. You have a database model which is running and deciding what SQL queries to write and to execute. So while modeling a database, there is a choice of how much data you want to store. Like let's say if you want to store the minimum data, you will just want to focus on what are the final parameters which are required to answer the queries. And when you already know the query. Like let's say we are in this WebEx call and I just want to answer what how many people are here. So in, our, in my database, I will just store how many people are, have joined the meet and know the information. Like only just the just the number but let's say i want but later i want more data like i want to see how who were those people who joined so i want i want to have saved both the the number and also the also the users who had joined so so in this way i will be able to identify who are the unique users who had joined and and you can see when i'm st starting to store more and more data i can get more and more information out of it like i can try to correlate the patterns between the those who had joined through different sessions and all and similarly for Moodle you can the database might just store the final uh, the final score for each test but usually stores 
like you have given a test on Moodle, which was let's say MCQ quiz. But after the quiz, you can just let's say delete all your data and just store the final marks because that's what matters. But the problem here is that that you might currently think that that that's what matters. But later you might have some other query like let's say someone tried for a regrade. And after that, the answer key changed. So if you had lost the data of how of what all of what all were the actual choices he made, then you have you will be in a big disadvantage. So so in that way, your database will be limited by the assumptions you had made earlier. So I hope many of you are able to read it by this point. You can reply in chat. Like in many cases, you might have tried to go for regrades or changing the answer key, and in that cases, it is very important to have all the questions marked. Similarly, I think in your J days, they they used to show you each the question ID and also your response for it. So in the in case you want to ask for a regrade, then you have the exact question ID and also the option which it was. So that way they can. Easily change the answer key for everyone. Like there are so many participants in that. So data a good database design is very important from the start. And also, let's say if you don't want to make any assumptions, then the best approach is just store everything in form of events. Like let's say a data always starts from nothing, and after that you can start starts storing each event. And let's say in this WebEx meet, in starting there was no one, only I had joined, but later. I can I can store each and every entry and exit on this WebEx meet like the, all the time stamp, with timestamp. So using that data, I can reconstruct the original state state which I wanted. Like I, if I want how many people were present in the meet at 5:30, I can just see the data which I have collected and and go from the entry and exit and just add the entries and and subtract the exits. So I will have that data. And also if I store the usernames, I will be able to maybe. Use the data while maybe giving you the grades for the assignments. So this way, whatever data you may collect, that is useful. Especially in this modern age, you don't know how you can use the data later. Like let me, like I can show an example. Like whenever you browse on Amazon, it actually stores how much time you spent on each page, how much time you spent on scrolling it. Like do you want me to show the example with Amazon? It might get a bit messy because they are collecting too much of data. And they can do that because they have a lot of storage and lot of computation resources. Okay, let me go to Amazon. Let me go to Inspect Network. Yeah, let me go to Mobile. So through these requests, let me just. Whenever I suppose you can see this request, rendered to be meaningful, rendered to be viewed. Like these are many internal terms they have defined. Okay, and these are logging each and every movement of how the my web page is looking right now. I keep scrolling like that. Like this. Like see, it it counted the, how many times I scrolled. What is the dwell time? Scrolling distance, reach depth, scroll count, client time to first scroll. 
the dimensions of the screen I'm using. And it is like transferring all this. It might not be storing all this database in all this data in this database, but it is collecting all this information and later it might decide what kind of information is good to be stored in my data in the database and what is not. Okay. They have all these markers. Time to view, time to invest. Yeah. So you just got a glimpse of how much data can be collected and how much can be logged. And similarly, I think if you want to make a very secure version of Moodle, or at least the quizzing system in that, where you are attempting the answers, you can actually store after how much time the person is, let's say, switching the questions. Like you, like each click you can store there. Like the question, the person, the student is at this question, and after how much time the student is at another question. So that way, you will have the complete information of how the whole quizzing event went. Like how the whole assignment went and and by that you can make more analytics like if the people are let's say solving it very late or how much time the people are spending on one question etc so maybe you can think if you want to implement something like moodle what kind of data would you be storing Yeah, so let's move to cookies and sessions. Cookies and sessions are very important part of a day of understanding how the backend and the clients react. So let's talk about the set cookie header. There's a documentation for it on Mozilla. It, it sends a cookie from the a server to the user agent. So the server, so the user agent can send it back to the server later. So and these are basically key value pairs. Like here, I can see in the for that you have to go to the Chrome developer tools, applications, then cookies. There was a yeah, application, cookies. I can see all the cookies. Like this is actually the Google Analytics cookie. This is stored like this. Uh, so I have attached a very interesting article how the Google Analytics cookies used to track your data. Like this GA cookie. This stores your client ID. Like to each and every user, it, it gives this client ID and this is the timestamp. So whenever you are, you visit a page which uses Google Analytics, it will pass this cookie to, to it. Like here you can see that in the request, this like google analytics.js whenever it loads this file it yeah it passes this cookie which is this underscore g equal to this value so now this google now the google analytics page knows wh who, which user i am and it also maintains uh, my history on its own side so it can collect more and more information about me but once i delete this cookie from my browser it will have to give me another client id so it will identify me as a completely new user. So you might, you might want to sometimes expand by deleting this cookie and seeing if your maybe your search results or your advertisement suggestions changed. So if you try that, do mention the Discord server how your experimentation went. Yeah. So now let's go back to the restaurant example. I will send the link to the PPT also later. But now for some time, let's go back to the restaurant example. How many of you have ordered food at Delhi 16? On campus. Yeah, so Kushak, whenever you go to Delhi 16, 
the first thing you must have noticed that they assign you a token that green thing so after you get assigned a token in their system they start inputting the whatever your order is like let's say whatever you want to order you want to uh, order a naan you want to add, order some paneer or some thali and that whole order is associated with your token and once you have paid that is like your let's say you have passed the authentication that whole slip is authenticated like your your payment is completed and that is verified on the slip and then you have this green token which is very similar to this authentication token we are which we are going to see here and and then although all the that database was in the bill is passed on to the server <laughs> which actually like serves you the food so in that sense that server knows the information about you and can identify you you using the to the token cookie or let's say that that green token whatever you call it also one more loop you must have seen here is that it is it is not remembering you by your face or so maybe you can give your token to your friend and they can also log in using it not log in i mean if your friend is using that token and goes to the server i mean the waiter who is actually making the food then the waiter will think that that your friend must have ordered it because he has that token and it will serve the same food to him and it will keep the entries like he has given you naan but not paneer etc etc on his own records so are you getting this example yeah nice so similarly we have this session cookie so whenever you open a website a session cookie is used by the backend is sent by the backend i have explained it in in more detail here yeah the session cookie is is generated and sent by the backend and, and is given to the front end client on, and is stored on your browser so 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 which with corresponding to each session cookie the backend expresses stores some session variables and some session data which is stored on the server side and once you pass the session id in each request it can know that yes it was this this same client which had made made some request earlier and i already have this much data about this client and i'm going to show how the most typical authentication systems work and they work in a very similar fashion the database has the username and hashed passwords for each user if you want to go into detail why the password is hashed or how hashing works you can also tell that me tell in the chat and we can come to that later so when the user visits the website the session cookie is set then the login form has fields for username password and also hidden csrf token we can also talk about this csrf token later if you want when user submits the form the form is submitted using the post method like i think you must have learned about the http request methods in the api assignment so this is a kind of a post request where the data is passed in the post body so once all these three things are passed to the server it first verifies the csrf token which basically checks if the request is coming from the same web page or not and then if it check for username and password from the database if it is correct and if they successfully authenticated it, a cookie which stores the authentication is sent by the server so you can see think like the authentication is like your that paytm like whenever your payment is verified on paytm like paytm pay 20 rupees prapt hue that is your authentication confirmation so so once that authentication is confirmed the cookie which stores the auth token which is another is sent by the server and this is similar to the tokens which is given by at daily 16 so after each success, successive request later the client is supposed to send this token to, to let's say present this token in the authorization header for each request and then the server will see that oh this was the client which had which had already authorized but not i had already authorized it already has an authentication token so at least someone might have authorized like in delhi 16 you must have seen the guy who is making the food and serving the food that has not seen your face when you were actually making the payment 
but by that uh, trust token it can see that oh you have this token that means someone who who he trusts like the person who was who is taking the payment must have given you this token after verifying everything so it so if this was not the case then you may, you would have have to to let, to actually store your username and password on the client side and then pass the username and password in each request and that would not be very a very safe option you can go through this authorization header credentials these are different type of authorizations yeah so do you want me to show you an example of how this authentication works using let's say something which you must be using regularly like the your webmail okay so actually with the mail i don't i didn't want to show it live because whenever i show the tokens and all they're actually the active tokens so it's like the server has given me a green token but but in the physical world it is a real token no no one can snatch it from me but in the online one that token is just like a number so let's say in the in the daily 16 rather than giving a, you a physical manifestation of that token is just like your token number is 71 so anyone who knows your past your token is 71 can go and say i am 71 and take it so similar is the case with this online authentication so if someone just copies my token and paste it then I, they can actually gain access to my credentials so i have just taken the screenshots of it so once you open the web mail it, it says it sends this set cookie header and, the, and you can read this header. I had made a get request to Roundcube, which is the email client used by webmail. You, you can see this is a Roundcube session ID. This weird string path dash means the base path. It is secure and it is HTTP only. HTTP only means that only the you can see it using this application and only the and this token is this cookie is usually shared only over the HTTP network or the HTTPS like only in the headers you cannot access these cookies in using the JavaScript compared to the other cookies which can actually be used in the which can be accessed in the JavaScript part of the code usually I think document or cookies like let me see if I can show something here, like that here does this page have cookies this page does not have cookies does this has cookies? Okay, like, I mean, let's say this this cookie is not HTTP only. If I write document dot cookies paid, that did not work. But there are other methods of accessing cookies from the JavaScript also. Like some, they must have used some security like that. So let's go back to our example. First, the header, the server has sent this set header, set cookie header, which was HTTP only. And as, and then it is saved in my browser, which I can see from the application tab. And the expiry date here is shown as session. That means whenever I close this, my browser session, or I close my browser, or let's say restart it, this cookie will get deleted and I will have to get another session ID. And then I input my password and all. So when when I click submit or when I click login after enter my password, it passes my this CSR token, my username, which is this Kerberos ID, and also my password through this form data, which is a post request. And also in after that post request gets like verified that my password is correct. It must have some internal linking with the Kerberos 
authentication system which stores which actually stores the passwords then this round cube gives me this session auth token like you can see set cookie session auth this thing secure and sticky only and i can see that here my session auth cookie is here an interesting thing about this is that the only way for the client to for now the server to identify you is using this session these tokens and cookies so if you just copies copy the values and all the parameters properly you can actually hijack the cookie or this is called session hijacking so i think they might have a section on that too session hijacking I think my network disconnected for a while. Wait. Wait, can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry, I must have got disconnected. Okay, so where was I? Like which side was I at? What was the last thing we were discussing? <laughs> yeah. What was the last thing that we were discussing? Okay, session authentication. Yeah, so I had passed my password and now I've got this session authentication cookie and now this is stored. So whenever I make any request, like if I go to the settings page, this will this cookie will be passed in my request header. You can see in my request header, this cookie is going. So this is how the webmail server knows that I have already signed in and this is me. But by just seeing this session ID and this authentication token, it knows that this is this was me and I don't need to pass that my own ID or password each and every time. Also, when I log in, log out, you can see that it has deleted this cookie by setting it to delete and also it has expired it. Like I think this was just be I think a few minutes before the time the time I had logged out. You can see it, I think the date expired. Yeah. It also it always gives the expiry date a minute before the actual time. So that's what about the, the whole backend engineering part. So before we move to Django, do you have any doubts?
Yeah. This is a very good question. How does it secure against someone copying the odd token to gain access? So actually it's not very easy to copy the odd token. First of all, this token is HTTP only, which means that unless someone actually tracks my HTTP request, like let's say there's a man in the middle, when I'm passing the token, it, it copies the token and says it for itself. And then it is not easy to actually capture this. Like here I'm showing you can e easily copy it because you are the main, you have access to this application tab and you have access to reading each of the headers. But usually the hacker is not going to have these accesses unless they are sitting in a position where they, are, they can actually monitor each and every request that is going from your browser and see, can see each of the headers. So, so for details on that you can see here. Session hijacking. Yeah. When an attacker takes weak session ID then insecure hacking. Transmission pain text. So this is how the session ID is usually protected against this session hijacking practice. But just for experimenting, you can still try to do this on your own machine. Like maybe copy from one laptop to another laptop or your own, or maybe copy from one browser to another, or maybe copy from your main browser to your incognito browser. Because when you go incognito, another new session is created and all the previous cookies are deleted. So that would be fun. So now I think we should okay. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Are cookies stored in both browser and database to keep user logged in? Yes, basically the session ID is stored in yeah. The session ID here is stored in the just the browser and and associated with the session ID is a whole set of session data session data like session values. Like you can have much many more variables which are stored on the server side. So the database stores both the session ID and, uh, and also associated with it whatever the data is stored. Like let's say there is a cart. Like, like uh, let's say I am making an e-commerce platform. Then along with the session ID, I will store whatever items I have in the cart in, in the server. So can you get the idea? So now let's move to Django. So the tag, so the tagline of Django is a web frame framework for perfectionists with deadlines. It makes it easier to build better web apps more quickly with less code. So one of the main reasons of choosing Django was that you already have experience with Python in your call 100 course, you will be able to apply it here and also learn it in more depth. As with Django, I told you that with the backend, you can make this session authentication database form. And also maybe if, if you had made some very interesting programs in your courses in Python, you can host them on this cloud machine which runs Python and then have a interface which allows you to give inputs to the program here and the program, the server will run the Python code and give you the output to the user. So that can get very interesting. Yeah, so let's get started with Django. Yeah. Get rid of this, this SQL. Yeah, I have created uh, this empty directory. So first let's talk about, yeah, as you, many of to, you told me that you have not learned about Python, this pip. So let's see about pip. 
so page basically allows you to to get the packages which are basically python codes written by other users or let's say a group of many users and just download them very quickly and integrate into your own project so you can import and import them very conveniently like these are many popular packages like you can see the projects file so many here This is one installing packages. So before installing packages, you need to make sure that you have Python installed, and along with Python, you have this pip installed. So usually Python and pip are installed simultaneously, but you should just check if you have pip or not. So the thing with pip is that some whenever you install something normally, it it gets installed to a main user. Like when you must be installing applications on your let's say Windows machine or some other machine, it always gets installed to your main. I think that program files directory, right? So if you keep installing more and more applications, that program files directory is going to get very messy. Like so many programs here. And also, so you might want some different versions. Like, let's say you want some version of that program, but now you you have some version of the a live a, a project. But when you download some so another project uses, which uses the previous version of it. So this is why we don't usually use pip normally. Like, let me show you show you my. Let me show you the help here. Like, let me show you pip. Yeah. What all pip can do? Pip can install packages, download, uninstall. This is very interesting. I will come to this later. List the install packages, show information, search for packages, etc. So as I have been using Python for a long time, you you will see I have many packages like this. I have so many packages. So this is why my workspace is very cluttered up. Like if I import Django, it might be a different version from what I want actually. And and with different version, many kind of breaking changes come. Like some changes with some code which was written using Django two might not work with Django four. Also, let's see the pip search functionality inside Django. Okay, never mind. So let's just go to the other one. Yeah. So this is why, as this environment is going to get messy, and we'll have different versions for each project, we create a special virtual environment. So when I create this, I use this Python three module BNV. That means virtual environment, and I create an environment named ENV. I hope this works well. <laughs> so yeah, I have this folder called NV. Let me just show this folder. So this NV folder has bin lib, which shows all the packages which I have already installed on this. Include this is empty. Bin which are the binary executables like Python, Python three, and all. So now first I'm I have to activate this like currently if I write type Python sorry if I type Python 3 currently the my Python is using the main user binary Python which is my system's main Python similarly for for pip it is the main pip but now I want you to use the Python which is in this active in the binary in the env slash bin folder so to do that I'm going to activate it source this this source command i don't know if you have a hint okay source env slash bin slash activate when i run this command you can see i have this env that means i'm in the 
in the environment now so if i write type python 3 this shows me that I, i'm in and my python is 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 you being used from this location similarly for pip my pip is being used from this position i can see the pip version this was not the version capital v 20.3 so first i might want to upgrade my pip version pip install and the flag is upgrade pip so i have upgraded my pip from 20.2.3 to 22.1.2 so i hope everyone has followed me till here Okay, you want me to go through the env commands once again. So let me do it without errors this time. I'm going to open a new window. I will expand it. Because this is a bit of a tricky part and you might mess up your Python installations sometimes because of this. So first I go to my directory. Let me move my old version yeah so first i do python 3 module bnv nv which is my environment or should i call you call this okay let's uh, dev django environment so if i do ls it has created a folder called Django environment. And if I open this folder, you can see I have this, all these files. And this when I have this activate script, which will make sure that my, whenever I write Python, it will use it from here. So I'm going to use the source command, source env, so put Django env, bin activate. Now I'm in the Django in the environment. Pip list. So as you can see, there are not so like uh, previously there was there were a lot of pre-installed packages on my main system, but now my this installation is completely independent from all that. Let me just update my pip version so I don't get this warning. Otherwise, twenty is also fine. Yes. So only the pip is installed and the setup tools installed. This is also needed by pip to install other tools. So now that let's finally install Django. Pip install Django. So we have installed Django now. So in fact, if I go to my environment, you can see that this this is installed in the library Python three point eight side packages. This Django. So all the the code for Django is written here. Like from the is downloaded here. Like there are so many important things here. So now to create a so now let's go back to the Django tutorial. It's fine. Writing your first Django app. Yeah. So basically, the Django admin helps us to with many features of Django. So let me write it here. Django admin help. It has all these like we are going to use mainly make migration, migration server and start project. So we are going to start project. Let's say our, what should we call it? Yeah. 
learning Django. Okay. The command is Django admin start project learning Django. Yeah, actually, I think the dash is also not allowed in the naming. So let me do it like this L capital D capital. Or let me show you the error message first. See, learning Django is not a valid project name because it does not like having this dash in the name. So I'm going to replace it this with Django and learning. Yeah, so you can see it has created a folder for learning Django. I can just open the directory structure again. So learning Django. This is the project folder and this is the manage.py and it will contain more features which we can use later. Let me seed into this learning Django. LS item 3 manage.py run server. Back here also you can see they start a project they run the server you can see that it has started a development server at this address so many of you must have must be recognizing this address 127.0.0.1 this is basically your local host so this page shows that my installation worked successfully and I can also access this from my local host. But I think 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 also does the same thing. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, so let, let me open this in my VS Code. Because that is better for like bigger projects. So I hope everyone is comfortable with using VS Code by now. I just got that I wrote this program. Yeah, I go to terminal. And here again, I will have to activate the Python shell. Okay, I think there's a command for that. Select interpreter. Yeah, look. This one. So this way I have been able to select the Python shell. Yeah. So that's it. so whenever when I have selected use this command for command pair from command pair or select interpreter. Now the VS Code has already in this source command on my machine. So I can I got in, into this environment. So yes, we, we got the server running. Let's give it a tab. Development server. So as you can see, there's this debitor SQLite 3 file created here. This is basically a an SQLite SQLite 3 SQLite actually uses the uh, file to store all the database. And, and in, uh, only in this file, all the data is stored. So if I want to see the size, currently the size of this file is zero. But I am going to run this command. We'll come to migrations shortly. File migrate. So now the size of the stable has increased so much so i think i can use my sql3 command yeah it, is. it shows me all the tables which are present here 
Hmm. So most of those tables are going to be empty right now because we have not really started anything yet. But we can check out the Django admin log. Select star from Django admin log. Okay, this is also empty. So we can maybe migration start from Django migrations. So all these migra database migrations were made and it has selected all, all of these for me. So let me get it again. Control D. <coughs> so first let's go over the folder structure now. This is just an empty file. This is for configuring the server. They store the settings for the project. This file. Like all which are the apps on this. The URL schemes. Like this this path goes to this function. And these are the settings for the other type of servers. And this is the manage.py. <laughs> so now let's come to what are the difference between a project versus an app. The project is the whole collection of apps which which can yeah, Ajit is asking, can we use a JSON type database? Yes, I think we can use use the Django with with MongoDB etc. Also, and it will apply the migrations to do it. But actually, the the mod the this architecture of having a model is is mainly designed for SQL based systems where I. Which which have a fixed table, so where you have to actually make a migration. Like if you maybe added a column, then then in the table also, if you added a field in your model, then you will have to add a column in your database. So so first let's talk about the projects and apps. An app is a part of a project which does something. Like let's say start app pools. So for some time, let's decide what we want this app to do. So does anyone have any ideas what we should build today? Like from this, you can think where do we need a backend? So one of, and one of the use cases I defined is let's focus on this authentication and the database. Like like okay, Sashang wants to recreate Moodle because Moodle also uses authentication. And also, this database is used very frequently there. So, the point of doing this is that we will have custom functions to to make make sure the user is accessing only the data which he is allowed to access and not the whole thing. So let's go here. Yeah, but before that, I'll just show you the basics of Django, like how the templating engine and all work. So first let me create a test app. Python three manager file. No, test is actually a reserved keyword. Let's say playing. We are just playing around for now. Start app playing. So we have this app which has we are just playing around for now. So these are views. These this is the five models. And admin. So how the URL routing scheme works is so let's talk about views first. So basically a view is a is a function which takes the request and then returns a response. So let's say we have this definite index usually index is used for like the default view let's say it will take a request as, as a parameter or let's say an argument and say return and sorry what are the sticky sticky response return http response Hello world. And then what I want is that 
in this URL scheme from playing dot views from playing we are going to import views as let's say they view because data we are also going to import views from other projects so let's have a different name for each so what we want is that if a request a request goes to path playing then that should get redirected to play view dot index this function which was here if i try to run the server now playing it shows me hello world you can see sorry yeah and let's say similarly i can have functions for each page let's say i have a function for buy which is request return http response buy your So in the URL scheme, I can just write path playing slash by play view dot yeah, like this. So okay, yeah. As you must have noticed, whenever I when I whenever I save this file and make a changes, the manager file automatically reloads the server. Like I I made a change, I press save. It has already started to reload. Yeah. So now if I go there, slash by, it gives me by first. So similarly, we can have other URL schemes. And also, and also we can take some parameters in the URL. Like path name. Let's say we have I'm not sure if this is going to work. In the view, I need to add oh. I can actually keep the same name here. We can just try like this. Okay, when I go to function, okay, it gives an expected keyword argument name. So this means the Parameter which I have kept here should have the same name as there. Like if I am de defining a, a name here, then there also I should use the same word name. Yeah, it says hi Aditya. So now it's not always convenient to send the HTTP responses like this. So we are going to use the temp use the Django templating engine. So basically, we make this templates folder, templates, and let's say we can have a new file. We are going to do this. Or oh, let's say we have this index.html. Or let's say we have we have hi.html here. we can have a whole html document 
like head title in the body we can have and now what i want is that i want to pass so let's say i just return it like this return i use this render this takes a template name render I use render and then I'm going to I'm going to pass the file path file.html and let's see if that worked. There's a template name. The request. It wanted me to pass the request also. Template does not exist. I think I want to add the templating path. So it must be somewhere in the settings. Okay. New folder. Okay, let's see where it was looking for the templates. So basically, if I just move the folder here, now it should work. Yeah. Something does not exist. I don't know. With this code, let me try filling this. It tells me to include the template directories. So let me see my setting there. Settings path. This was here. Okay, so let me just first add my app here. Let's see if that worked. No. Let's see. Where am I template? Yes, here I should try. I'm not sure if this is going to work. Template so that oh. yeah. See now it is working. So basically now I have added this template slash playing folder to the templates file. So this is giving rather than hard having to hard code the response each time. This is serving me an HTML file, but also this is not just a normal HTML file. I can pass the names. I, I can pass more parameters here. So let's say name is the name parameter. So now I'm I can access this parameter by using this kind of a magic shortcut here. 
नेम रिक्वेस्ट दिस फाइल एंड ऑल्सो द नेम पैरामीटर एंड इट पास टू दिस एच टी एम एल एंड दिस एच टी एम एल टेम्पलेटिंग एजेंट एक्चुअली इंसर्टेड द पैरामीटर विच द सवर द व्यू हैड पास टू इट and has generated this view so this is why we say it can dynamically dynamically generate this html page based on the server what the server wants okay so it has that even understood till now you can reply in the chat yeah so let's try to make the templating more interesting or let's save it for now so now let's move to the what we were actually planning to build we want to be, build a kind of a moodle system but we are going to build only one functionality on it like this now स्टूडेंट और पीछे student and then each student can access only his grade so in this demo we are going to cover the concepts of the database also and authentication also like we will need users which will be authenticated that this yes this user has this id or has this in the course and it will be like the administrator will be able to access all the grades but the student will be able to access only his grade and and the way the student accesses his grade will be determined by this our our custom function yeah so let's go ahead and start working on it this is a yeah let's create a new project Let's create a new app. Yeah, Python three minus dot five. Start app. Wait, start app. Let's call it grade. Call it course. Let's call it grading. Yeah. So when I see the grading. For the authentication, we are going to use the default model of Django. Then let me show you. It already provides that. Python three minus dot five. I'll just show you the documentation first. User authentication in Django, which is basically based on that country package. so it already provides us a user class which can be stored in the database and we also have the super users which we can create like this let me create now so i hope I, my screen is of a sufficient size for everyone dot by create super user the name is going to be me aditya singh email address is 
it doesn't really matter actually password is a b c d 1 2 3 4 a b c d 1 2 3 4 if you see the password is too common because a b c d 1 2 3 is 4 is a very common password but i'm just going to bypass the validation for now so the supervisor is created now if i go to the the that admin i have to start the first i will pull one server my server is running when i go to this admin it all it gives it gives me an admin page this one uh, abcd one two three four yeah so let's see how we got here so so when we first hit the any url it went to the url this dot file we hit the admin part so it went to this admin dot site dot urls and this was defined in the django contributed admin package yeah so let me just log in here and see what's what they have so i already have this uh, this classes for users and groups like initially i have only this one user and later and also ha i have groups so if i click on my user you can see it has the way to storing my password is very weird it has this algorithm and I, the iterations the sort and the final hash why this is then because we are we use a hash which is a that's hashing does everyone know about hashing functions okay so basically a hashing functions take takes a string and then converts it into another string such that the mapping is actually unique but it is, it is not a, but you are not able to get the string back e easily like let's say we have just ss256 hash we can complete it online if i let's say my password or abcd1234 now rather than storing abcd1234 it is going to store this string so so when it just has to verify if my password is correct when when i input abcd1234 it will first compute it hash and from the database it will com compare it with this and this will match but if if the database gets compromised somehow like someone gets access to the database files then even if they see the hash they will not be able to identify that my password or abcd1234 this is very important because even if they have the hash they cannot first gain access to my account and secondly sometimes people use the same password in many different sites you must have also experienced that many times so in that case if the password is leaked from one site and it was stored in plain text then the hacker can try the same password for that user in other sites too so this is why hashing is very important in security now these are the basic things we have so let's add a user here let's call him user1 let me get them password abcd1234 let me try to get the same password abcd1234 and let me save it see the password is to one and and here i'm not allowed to override this so i want to keep a stronger password abcd at 1234 abcd at 1234 so this is saved no time let me give this a star status so basically a star status is a user which can log into this admin site and these are the other things associated with it save let me create another one User two, A B C D one two three four. Let me save it. Yeah. I'm giving the size changes. That's because I want to show the authentication for now, the basic authentication. 
later when we build our own authentication like our own login form then we won't need this star this admin need to log into into this admin or site which is already built let's say here so let's assume both of these are students for now and now in our grading we are going to create a model so in the python docs you can see how a model works Yeah. So whatever data I want to store, I want to describe it perfectly, and based on this description, it is going to create the SQL queries, and also it will make sure that whatever information I enter it is always following this kind of guidelines. You can see the here. I, I wrote the, the in the documentation they wrote this code in Python. And and when the Django is creating migrations, it translates this to the, the SQL the corresponding SQL query. Like this is a default. This first name column they have created, which is a character with length six thirty because the matching was thirty. This is not nullable. And last name is thirty. Not nullable means that you cannot leave it empty. My app person. Yeah, so here you can have different types of queries. So now let's try to create a model. Class grade and this image from model dot model. In the grade, we are going to have first a character. This is the course name. Okay. With max length, let's say you only need six, right? Like if you have call hundred, that is six characters. And similarly for the marks, let's say you have integer marks only, no point five, etc. You can store so the mark. Models for fields for integer field. Here, no extra is required. And now we are going to use a very interesting feature of the database, which is called a foreign key. If I want to store for which the student, because as you can see, when I created the student, it created a unique student ID for each of them. So with the foreign key, I can make a reference to that student from inside the grades model. And let's say models dot fields dot the foreign key. And for that, I'm going to use the user model from the authentication. Again, okay. Django dot config dot auth dot models import user. User. So once we are done with this, we have to first register this app. Right, let me go to this learning Django setting. So it knows that we have installed this app. Like reading. This is always a good practice to do it initially. Okay, this giving me an error and on delete. Well, to model dot cascade, which is like their default value for a foreign key. Yeah. So I hope everyone has uh, understood the model till now.
you can just confirm in the chat So just for storing a grade, grade of a, so this will actually be like a grade of a, a grade table will be created and it will be having fields for the course, the marks and the student. So let's see what this casket actually does. Like basically, if you delete a person who's whose foreign key was used somewhere then all the other objects which were associated with, with them will also be deleted like let's say here they, you were they were using this like the article was having the reporter versus the author of it as the foreign key so when the reporter was deleted the article also gets deleted in our program we have the user we, have, we are using the user as a foreign key in grade. So if a user gets deleted, his grade will also get deleted from the database. So just in case someone uh, tries to search, his, search for a grade, he won't be uh, ended up with a user ID which cannot be found. And to make sure that the this model is available on the admin panel, which we were seeing earlier, we have to register it here. I think I have to see the reference here. Admin dot site dot register this admin dot site dot register. Now I have to input the model from dot models input. Okay, this was the model I created. I'm going to register this grade. So now I will be able to to change this grade from the admin portal. Yeah, so I can go to the I can go here. Yeah, so Python three. Like first you can see the this migrations was empty. I'm going to make migrations. Right. Make migrations. It has created this migration, which is the initial one. And this migration depends what all has been created here. And also it is a more verbose form, like it contains all the things which were earlier assumed default. Like this ID is a default field, but I don't have to explicitly declare it. But when it is making the migrations for the SQL database, it has to declare this explicitly. If I do model.py. Then my grade or something like this. Yeah, so it actually gives me the okay. It gives me the SQL query which is, is going to run when I write when I make the migration. So when I when I'm going to write this command Python three minus dot i migrate. It is going to uh, to execute this query in this SQL database I had earlier. This is create table grading grade ID. This kind of ID which is integer, course, marks, student, and all. Yeah, then I write this command migrate. 
it has run the migrations. And now if I open the SQLite database again, type three, db dot SQLite, yeah, tables. See, it has the gradient of grid table. And also we can see the odd users table here also. Select star from odd because we added two users, right? You see, we had the Yeah, we have all these parameters associated in the auth user table and currently the grading grade table is going to be empty. To populate it, we are going to use the admin panel again. So let's go to the admin panel. There we go. Yeah. So as, as I had registered this to the admin panel, you can see here I have this in the grading app. I have this grades kind of what do you say mod model in this grade currently in this table i have only zero grades so when i add a new grade i can let's say force call 100 let's see what someone called my 56 and this was the user one so i just save here and i create another grade object say for call 100 only and i write marks this is 73 is opened by user 2. Save. Yeah. So now we are going to write the views with which the user will be able to access his grade. Like that. Let's. Like currently for this grading, I'm, I'm only going to have this one view for this request so i'm just naming this index if user dot is authenticated it is request dot user is authenticated and you can see this is checking by the same cookies and other systems we were talking about earlier like in fact even right now i think i must be using some cookies here application I have this CSI token and this FN ID. And, and whenever I go in the network tab, my session ID is being passed. Let's see to my home server. All the cookies are being passed. It's all syndicated. First, let as the let's go back to the tutorial and explore the how we can interact with the model which we have stored now. The models and the let's see, we can just go to the Python shell. You can go to the Python shell and we can try all these commands. Okay. Let's do this. In fact, we can see those database in our SQLite browser also. Like select star from grading grades. Sorry, I have to do yeah. from grading grades. So see, for the the first entry in the grading table is call has name call hundred, mark fifty two, and the user ID is two. Like you must have seen here, or user like two was for this user one, and this ID three was for user three, user two. So, so rather than writing these SQL queries again and again, we are going to use the the shell which is just providing us with, with which you can access these databases using the Python commands. Shell. Now I'm going to import. From grading. Great. Yeah. 
let's say grade dot objects let's go by step by step head to dr grade that shows me what all kind of commands i can run on this grade which is actually in a python object right now so i can see these are the many things we can do with this we are going to do with objects grades dot objects yeah or this dot now let's see what we can do with this we are going to go with all grade dot objects dot all so if i just see the zero entry it's a great object and then if i do if I, let me just store it first in a variable for easy access g equal to this dr g yeah so if you can see they have this student id this and this student id the student the marks its own id and also it will be having the codes yeah the string and also the grade dot object find object if i do the grade dot object i have to do this get i have this get query so i'm going to do dot get id equal to let's miss a student id equal to 2 so it has given me this dot let's say marks this is the student id 2 has got this many marks so first i am going to object obtain the student id here student let me give this a different name student id equal to request dot user dot id and then grade equal to first i'm going to have to import the model on dot models import grade grade equal to grade dot dot objects dot get student so id equal to student ids and then of course we are just going to make the copy of this course name equal to grade grade dot course like i think we have this here yeah and similarly we can have the marks equal to grade dot marks so let's return this as a response that earlier we had that stp import stp response for to return a response the response we have stored in python have you used f strings like when you put f in front of them okay nice mark mark in in minute course course so i have you have scored this many marks in, in this course this is and if the user was not authenticated we can write return http this tp response no or uh, not logged in we are doing this to keep it simple otherwise we could have just redirected him to the login page that would be more user friendly so 
let's try to test this in the URLs. I'm going to get add this to path grades from grading report use as you Trade view dot index. So whenever I make a re request to this grades, it will get passed on to that function. So let's try to test this. Yeah, it was great. Grade matching query does not exist. Okay, when I use this query, the model does not exist because I think I am logged in with the administrator which has ID 1. So let me create another exception for that. Get Uh, this yeah I can I, I can use this get object of 404 which is from control get object from 404 So to use this function, I'm going to use get object of grade student ID student underscore ID equal to student ID. Yeah. So I hope this should give a better error message now. It will still give an error message. Yeah, it will give a fail photo for entry. But let me log out and log in from the user one. Let me just log out here. And now I'm going to use the user one ABCD at one, two, three, four. I'm going to log in. So let me show you the logout login process actually. I go to the network, I go to login. So one ABCD at one, two, three, four. Like when I got this page, they had actually given me some cookies and this CSRF token cookie. So when I log in, you can see the same info gets updated in my session ID only. So this time when I load this, my new session ID will get passed and I will get this message. You got 56 marks in call and course. And this is a fine example because now I cannot, as my request is validated by the session ID, I cannot get the marks of any other student because, because yeah. Yeah, because I cannot fake his session ID just like that. 
the session ID is generated very systematically, so it is unique for every user. So I think that will be it for now. And to later, and for improving this later, we can try to implement our own login for for the user, so it doesn't get to always access the admin portal. And if we can do many things, so I hope FN has followed till now. And you can ask if there are any more doubts right now. Okay. Let me close the other tabs. And and I think, hope you have got the point of most of the functions of a backend. We have two sessions, authentication, database. We did not get time to go through the forms and all. But creating forms is very simple on Django. If you use the, already the class based forms, which are basically like templates, you can just put in the fields and they will automatically generate a form for you. And we can export these APIs when we use some of them. So let's move to the assignment for this, for this session. So is everyone ready for that? Yeah. So these were the previous two assignments. This is the new assignment. So you have learned about backend engineering with Django in this session. Now you are going to use it to create a web app by yourself along the similar themes of our previous assignments. So here we are going to develop a DevClub learning management system. So basically things like Moodle and all are called learning management systems. If you like Google it, Moodle is an LMS. Learning management system. So we are going to create one of our own. Like first you have to see the what are the main functionalities of Moodle. Like both the instructor and student can log in. For each course the instructor uses the platform to share resources and announcements, release grades, conduct quizzes and other things. Like actually Moodle has this plugin system where you can actually plug in more apps in, into it and have more functionalities. So now your task is to create your own such a learning management system using Django where you can add functionalities as per your own creativity. Like I hope you have already have many ideas by now because you have seen how the backend works and also you have been using Moodle for almost a year now. Like you have completed your first year. So I would recommend you, you should have all organize your project using these apps like you have you should have an, an app for ma managing all the user authentication like here you can put the user forms and the auth logic and also the models for the student like with the student rather than just the default user you might want to add more fields like the let's say his Kerberos ID and other things with the instructor also you might want the department and which course etc and for the, each course you might want to store who is the instructor for this course and who are the students involved in this course and similarly for admin and I think for admin you might want to use the default Django class only and for the grades you can use the class you can create a class similar to which I had showed you today but we are going to ha have a proper structure of courses like here I had used a string for the grade right the course was just a string so in your assignment the course should also be a foreign key and that course should because the course should be containing the information of students and instructors and also you, you can have a functionality to upload documents like sometimes our professors want to share the lecture notes or other material uh, so if you, you later get time you can try to implement the quizzes like you can have quizzes on Moodle like page wise question wise so also in that it would be nice if you can first create a question bank which will have many questions that in each question you can see store what is the question type the correct answer and all and whenever a teacher wants to make a quiz from that question bank he can choose the questions or maybe you can because so later you can have a functionality to, to make to pick those questions randomly also so all these things you have to think creatively and also like Moodle has this feature for communication 
like announcements, replying and messages. You can try to implement that. And you would be surprised this is all the all this is proposable in Django using basically the default things it provides you. Even for email services, it provides a default client which you can configure to send emails. So, uh, so you can try to implement as many features as you can. If you are not able to implement some, that would be okay. If you have some other idea, you can discuss in the Discord channel. Like you have an idea to dis uh, to make this kind of a feature, and you can work on that. And later, you should deploy it on Heroku. Heroku is a free hosting service. Let me show you. So and like it has a free tier and it has paid tiers also. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So it will allow you to run Django on the server with, so that everyone can access it. Like currently, I had this I had this running on my local host, so only I could run it. Later, you want that everyone the server should run on a virtual machine on the cloud, and everyone should be able to access it. And then the database should also be of a production level. If you create a RESTful API, first you should learn what a RESTful API is and then you should try to create a documentation for that using Postman. If you make this communication app, then, then make sure to add a markdown support. Basically, you must have seen in Discord and WhatsApp, they have this format that you can have double stars and other things. And also you can try to have email for notifications like after registration, you can send a mail. For important announcements, you can send a mail, etc. And if if the professor wants to up, upload the grades in bulk for for quizzes etc., then you should have a feature where the professor can just or the course instructor can just upload the a C, a CSV file or or if you want a JSON file or even an Excel or a Google Sheet link, and then you should pass the that file and then automatically make the changes to the database. Like if I have a yeah, I have showed you that great database. So you must have seen that when I was editing in the admin portal, it was taking a lot of time. Like I have to select each one. And also you can see how to generate PDFs and digitally sign them. Like if, if when you already have all the data of the grades, you can make a transcript or something out of that. And you can think of more security features for quizzes. Like I was saying that having like seeing on what is the order the question, the student is attempting, what is, etc. So I hope everyone has understood the task till now. You can reply in the chat if you have any doubts. So I guess that's it. And for submission, if you remember the previous like just, just like the previous assignments, you have to fork this repository from here. If you like it, you can start this also. And then you have to clone the repository on your own machine. And then you have to make the virtual environment like we did. In those steps you said it earlier. Then you can see I have already created this dummy LMS project for you. So observe that this is the, the project folder. The root folder is this directory only. Yes. Like the manager.py is here only. So you don't have to create another to, to run start project again because I have already done that earlier. You just have to run the start app for each of the apps you are going to make. So once I have made it, you have to like Maybe append the instructions here or in a separate file, like how we are supposed to run your project. How, what are the, if like both the, both the, as a hosting 
person and also as a user like how the user is supposed to use your project and also explain these features in the readme uh, it would be nice if you can have the pictures or some video with that and we are going to float a form for submitting the links and don't make any pull request on this repository because whatever work you do that will remain in your fork So I hope the submission instructions are clear. Yeah, like you might have found that this session was focused more on the basics and we have not covered most of the Django features till now. But you can use the resources which I provided. This is a nice video which will introduce you again to Python and also Django. This has one hour on Django and I think four hours on Python. This has very detailed Django tutorials and it will con con cover all the like the class based views and the forms and all how to create them. Mozilla has its own set of tutorials on how to on how to learn Django and you can also see the Django docs which we were following for our session in between. There is this inter interesting video by, by people from Instagram because they are using Django and they talk about how they are using Django at production level and also they talk about a time where Justin Bieber almost crashed Instagram because he used to have so many flop followers and Instagram using Django was not prepared for that much of a load. These are resources by a YouTube channel of Hussein Nasser. And later you can, when you are going to publish it, you can see the, the guides for deploying on Heroku and also how to create a documentation on Postman. So if you have any doubts, you can ask right now, or maybe you can ask in the Discord server. So we are going to send this session to end this session soon. And it was nice interacting with you all. Welcome.